Uh, we will now uh, reconvene and welcome our second panel of uh, witnesses. We have Dr. Andrew Biggs, who is a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute for Public Policy Research, and Mr. Bill Dugan, National President of the Fe National Federation of Federal Employees and Chairman of the Federal Workers Alliance. Welcome. Um, pursuant to committee rules, all witnesses will be sworn in before they test testify. If you wouldn't mind, please stand up and um, uh, raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Let the record reflect that all the witnesses have answered in the affirmative. Please be seated. Um, and in order to allow time for discussion, which we should have plenty of time, uh, please limit your testimony to five minutes. And uh, please note that your entire written testimony has been entered into the um, uh, record and made part of the record. Uh, Mr. Biggs, you are recognized. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Chairman Ross, Ranking Member Lynch, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to discuss efforts to right-size Federal employment going into the future. Academic economists agree that Federal employees receive higher salaries and benefits than private workers with similar education and skills. Much less is known, however, regarding the appropriate number of Federal employees. Is the Federal workforce larger than necessary to provide the services Americans require? There are no definitive answers, but several points may be helpful in considering these issues. First, how does today's Federal civilian workforce compare to that of the past? In 1969, there were 67 Americans for each Federal employee, while in 2009, there were 111 Americans per Federal worker. However, this does not necessarily imply that today's Federal workforce is too small. If the productivity of the Federal workforce followed that of the economy as a whole, each Federal employee today would be capable of serving around 135 Americans, just as each private sector employee today provides more goods and services than he did in 1969. Moreover, there is a large shadow workforce of Federal contractors who are not included in workforce statistics. Indeed, there are few good estimates of the total number of Federal contractors, nor is it easy to say whether overall they offer better or worse value to the taxpayer than career civil service employees. However, the rise of the contracted workforce does imply that the total number of Federal employees may be significantly higher than official statistics indicate. Second. How do Federal staffing levels compare to those in the private sector? The answer is that we simply do not know, principally because Federal activities often do not have clear private sector analogs. At the State and local level, such comparisons are easier to make. We know, for instance, that private schools often have less administrative overhead than public schools, allowing them to focus more resources on teachers in the classroom. If overstaffing is most likely to occur in places where it is most difficult to detect, then it could occur at the Federal level. We cannot know for certain without further analysis. Third, we can compare the U.S. to other countries, although because countries differ in how they delegate responsibilities among levels of government, only measures of the total public sector workforce are truly meaningful. Compared to other OECD countries, the U.S. Federal, State, and local workforce is slightly above the median. However, most OECD countries spend more than the U.S., making raw comparisons potentially misleading. Compared to governments that spend around the same as the U.S. government, which is around 36 percent of gross domestic product, the U.S. does have an unusually large public sector workforce. Of the seven OECD countries of similar economic size to the U.S., public employment averaged 11 percent of the total workforce versus 14 percent in the U.S. Policymakers hoping to reduce the size of the Federal workforce have focused on attrition, which seems a fair and less disruptive way to reduce the labor force if desired. Ordinary Federal turnover is very low compared to the private sector. However, the Federal workforce is around five years older than the private sector average and is generally eligible to retire at younger ages. Thus, there is the potential to reduce the size of the Federal workforce without firings and layoffs through the gradual process of retirement. When we think of right-sizing the Federal workforce, we need a clearer idea of what the right size will be. A 10 percent reduction in the Federal workforce, as recommended by the President's Fiscal Commission, is not a hard number. The appropriate number could be higher and lower. On the other hand, given the state of the Federal budget, there is also the danger of studying the issue to death without doing anything to address it. Gradually reducing the size of the Federal workforce while commissioning further analysis of the best size of total Federal employment and the best allocation of employees between agencies has the potential to shift staffing levels in the right direction without the danger of dramatically overshooting in the short term. 
Along the way, policymakers should monitor the effects of workforce reductions on the productivity of the Federal Government. I am confident that we can do more with less, but lawmakers should work together to find ways in which to do so. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Biggs. Uh, Mr. Dugan, you are recognized for five minutes for an opening. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairman Ross and Ranking Member Lynch, for inviting me to testify today. I am here on behalf of the National Federation of Federal Employees and the 110,000 Federal workers we represent as well as nine member unions of the Federal Workers Alliance, on which I serve as chairman. If I can leave you with only one message today, let it be this. You do not measure the size of government by the number of federal, federal workers. You measure the size of government in dollars and cents. This hearing is called Right Sizing the Federal Workforce. Implicit in the hearing's title is the insinuation that the Federal workforce is too big. While it may seem logical that if you reduce the Federal workforce, you have also reduced the size of the Federal Government, I can assure you that arbitrary reductions in Federal agency staff do not truly reduce the size of government at all. Reducing an agency's workforce without a corresponding reduction in the agency's mandate actually tends to increase the size of government, because arbitrary staffing limitations tend to cost Federal agencies more than they save. How is that possible? Federal workforce reductions without corresponding decreases in the work expected of agencies force agencies to rely on employees to meet their workforce needs. However, relying on contractors in this way generally costs taxpayers more than simply maintaining and properly staffing an in-house agency workforce. Contracting, though useful and economical in many cases, has some characteristics that make it expensive for agencies. Contracting out requires the government to conduct contractor oversight, which adds cost if done properly, but is sure to be expensive if not done properly. Private firms have to pay executive salaries, which make private firms more expensive than in-house staff. On top of that, contractors have to make a profit. All these factors make it difficult to deliver contractor services at the same value to the American taxpayers that the civilian Federal workforce can. This is particularly true for work that has not already been contracted out. The contractor workforce is currently about five times the size of the civilian Federal workforce. What is left in government is here for a reason. That is precisely why, during the Bush administration's competitive sourcing initiative, in-house Federal workers won the vast majority of public-private competitions, 100 percent of them in some agencies. In the end, there are generally no savings derived from arbitrary staff reductions. Rather, a cost shift moves resources away from the Federal workforce to contractors. This is a pointless exercise that reduces government efficiency, hurts the services that Federal agencies provide, and sticks taxpayers with a bigger bill. Of course, a bigger bill for taxpayers means bigger government, regardless of the impact on the size of the Federal workforce. As I said before, you do not measure the size of government by the number of Federal employees. You measure the size of government in dollars and cents. This is precisely why we are opposed to proposals that take a non-strategic, broad-brushed approach to cutting Federal jobs. Here are just a few we have seen recently. The Federal Workforce Reduction Act, H.R. 657, aims to reduce the size of the Federal workforce by allowing Federal agencies to hire just one employee for every two that leave the Federal service. The Federal Hiring Freeze Act, H.R. 1779, would abruptly freeze practically all hiring in Federal agencies, with very few exceptions. The Bowles Simpson proposal included a provision to arbitrarily reduce the Federal workforce by 200,000 FTEs by 2020 through allowing agencies to hire two new employees for every three that leave Federal service. Finally, the U.S. House of Representatives passed their fiscal year 2012 budget resolution, which called for an attrition policy in the Federal Government that permits Federal agencies to hire only one new employee for every three workers who leave Federal service. We strongly oppose all of these proposals to arbitrarily and non-strategically reduce the Federal workforce while showing little regard for the impact it will have on the services that the American people will lose as a result or the net budget impact when all costs are considered. However well-intentioned these proposals may be, they do not save taxpayers money, and therefore they do not shrink the size of government. That is not to say that we are opposed to all Federal government downsizing. 
The realities of our Federal budget situation are such that downsizing in some Federal agencies is appropriate. We understand that. However, if Congress is serious about truly reducing the size of government, then lawmakers are going to have to make the tough choices about which programs to reshape, scale back, or discontinue altogether. A nonstrategic, broad-brushed approach to cost-cutting that simply mandates significant personnel reductions in Federal agencies will fail to achieve savings and will cause wastefulness and disarray in numerous agencies throughout the government. Again, you do not measure the size of government by the number of Federal employees. You measure the size of government in dollars and cents. I appreciate the subcommittee's decision to hold a hearing on this matter, and I thank the subcommittee for the opportunity to provide testimony. Thank you, Mr. Dugan. I will now recognize, recognize myself for five minutes for questions. Um, the National Commission on Fiscal Responsibility's report states, although the Nation's economy struggles, continues to struggle, there is no recession in, in Washington. Um, Mr. Big, would you, would you agree with that? Sure. Uh, I mean, you know, the Federal Government has grown uh, during a time of recession, and there, there are some understandable reasons for that. Federal outlays on things like unemployment benefits are countercyclical, and there has also been an increase in employment due to the Census. At the same time, though, it, it is difficult on taxpayers and a burden on the economy if uh, the, the Federal Government is growing in size and the Federal workforce is growing in size at a time when the rest of the economy is, is least able to support that. So the burden is difficult uh, for the private economy when, when that economy is in recession and they have to support a larger government. Mr. Dugan, would you agree? Would you want to restate it? Or you... Uh, if you could restate it. No, no problem. Uh, the National Commission on Fiscal Responsibility Report states that although the Nation's economy continues to struggle, there is no recession in Washington. Would you agree with that statement? Uh, I am not an economist, but I can tell you that uh, for purposes of, of the Federal workforce, about 85 percent of the Federal workforce lives and works outside of Washington, D.C. So. Uh, let me ask you this. The, 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 the quit rate for Federal employees is about 1.57 percent, meaning that about one one and a half percent of all Federal employees quit, and which is, by the way, attrition. Would you not agree, then, that, that attrition is a good start in, in terms of trying to reduce the size of the Federal workforce? I, I think if, the goal, if your goal is strictly to, to downsize the workforce, then certainly attrition is a good tool. But again, I mean, if you are downsizing the workforce without looking at the work that is going to be left or that, or that you expect the remaining workforce to do, um, I am not sure that, 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 that it makes sense to, to, uh, to reduce a workforce until we have a discussion and an agreement on, on what the work is that is to be done and let the work dictate the size of the workforce that you need to accomplish that. And on that point, um, and Mr. Biggs, Mr. Dugan stated in his testimony, and I, I kind of agree with this, that you don't, you don't assess the Federal workforce by its numbers, but rather by dollars and cents. And in light of the fact that our national debt has reached $14.3 trillion, um, the, the fact that we have spent $400 billion last year in interest payments alone, uh, we face difficult tradeoffs trying to, to balance our budget. Can or let me ask you this: Should the federal government do more with less? Sure, I think the federal government has no choice but to do more with less because we're facing an increasing burden in the future. Um, and if you look at the federal budget today, we're borrowing something like 35 cents out of every dollar we spend. So we have to fix that and deal with the challenges of entitlements and other issues going forward. I think uh, the, the size of the public sector workforce is something that needs to be addressed. It will not by itself fix these problems. I think we all recognize that. And, and reducing the size of the federal workforce through attrition, would it disrupt critical uh, functions of the uh, government services? Well, obviously, that depends on what your view of, of critical functions is. I mean, I re remember that when the President took office, he said he was going to go through the Federal budget line by line and eliminate you know, wasteful or noncritical spending. Obviously, in their point of view, there wasn't very much there. My opinion would, would differ on that. I think we can maintain staffing and maintain effectiveness for the programs and the agencies that people clearly see as the most important. But we have to make di difficult decisions going forward about certain activities, you know, are, are these things the Federal Government is no longer going to do or no longer needs to do? And th those are the tough choices we face. Do you have any examples of jobs that could be better performed by the private sector at a savings of uh, uh, cost savings to the taxpayers? Well, I would think things like, uh, say, computer service support, things like that, where there are activities where you have uh, clear private sector analogs to what the Federal Government does. Um, you know, I fully acknowledge that many Federal workers have a skill set which is unique and which differs from uh, what 
uh, private sector workers do. Those are hard to outsource. At the same time, though, the Federal Government uh, runs computer systems. It has, it has upkeep and maintenance just as private sector uh, plans do. And I, I strongly suspect from my work on, on Federal pay issues that, that Federal employees in many of those areas may be overpaid relative to what private sector workers receive. Thank you. Mr. Dugan, on April 8, 2011, you wrote a letter to the White House asking them to hold firm against Federal pay cuts in fiscal year 2011 budget negotiations. In the letter, uh, you stated that, quote, Federal workers are, in fact, severely underpaid. Given the fact that as of December 2010, the average Federal uh, compensation, according to uh, OPM, including benefits, was $101,751, is it still your contention that they are underpaid? Well, I think there's been, there's, there's obviously been a lot of debate um, uh, on this issue, um, uh, both in Capitol Hill as well as in the media. And um, I, th I think I think the question begs, or the answer begs, uh, what data sets you are looking at. When, when you look at uh, the Department of Labor's uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics data, they show a, uh, a pay gap of approximately uh, 24 to 26 percent, I believe, um, with respect to the, uh, the, the compensation um, for private sector workers versus um, uh, the compensation that, uh, that Federal uh, workers make in similar types of jobs. So. Uh, uh, you know, it, again, you know, the, the, data, the data is going to lead you to different conclusions depending on, on where you get your data. Thank you. I see my time has expired, so I will now recognize the ranking member of the subcommittee, the, the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Lynch, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just on that, following up on that note on the cost of Federal employees, uh, I looked at those numbers, and what they have done is they've, they've, uh, they basically double counted. Uh, if you look at the cost figure, 101000 that is the pay. That is also uh, unemployment. You, you can't get your pay and unemployment at the same time. Uh, it is a hospitalization benefit. You can't get your pay uh, and unemployment and a hospitalization benefit at the same time, and a death benefit. And you can't get your pay and your health benefits and unemployment and uh, a death benefit, obviously, uh, if you are dead, at, at the same time. So they have multiplied the, the costs. Now, the employee doesn't get those all at one time, but they have lumped those together to, to reflect what the cost would be for the Federal employee. And uh, I agree, that is an expenditure for the Federal Government, each one of those, but that is not what the that doesn't go to overpayment of the Federal employee. They don't get all that at once. They, they, they cannot. It is physically impossible. Uh, I do want to uh, ask you, uh, Mr. Dugan, the, um, the President, well, we have got a couple of bills up here before us today that are the focus of this hearing. Um, uh, Ms. Loomis's bill, I think, is, is the more aggressive one, and it, uh, it purports to save uh, $13 billion over five years. The President's proposal, now that focuses just on, uh, quote, unquote, Federal employees, the people that you represent. Uh, the President's proposal uh, looks at the other 80 percent of the workforce, the contractor workforce, uh, and it proposes uh, cutting contractors from the from the payroll, uh, and and that is a savings of forty billion per year, not thirteen billion over five years, but forty billion per year. That's the president's proposal by cutting loose contractors. Uh, you know, help me with this. It isn't if we're interested in saving uh, money, and Mr. Biggs, I'd open this up to you as well. Wouldn't that seem to be the more uh, impactful approach to take, given the fact that we have got 10.5 million Federal employees, uh, excuse me, Federal contractors and grantees, and you have got only 2.5 million Federal employees? The, the, what the Congressional Budget Office calls the fiscal gap, which is the, 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 the change we have to make between our, our revenues and our outlays, is around 20 times higher than the $40 billion figure you, you cite. We would have to make up around $800 billion. How many, how many multiples is it of the $13 billion? I'm, I'm bad at math out of my head. Yeah, it's, it's a lot more. 
No, but the, but the point is, if you pose this as an either or, my, my point is it has to be both and then a lot more. Put those two together, multiply by 10 or so, and you are still not there. Why not? So the point is we have to look at both of these. I, I would not be opposed at all to looking at contractors. I think not enough is known about how the contract workforce uh, functions, whether we are getting good value for money. My point is the fiscal gap we face is huge. So if we think we can look at one group of employees or another group of employees, we are we're just kind of kidding ourselves. Right. And no, I think you raise a great point about the, lack, you know, the, the, the little we know about value on the contractor side. Uh, I remember one of our earliest hearings uh, when I was new to this committee uh, asking the uh, Defense Department audit agency how many auditors we had in Iraq. We were spending $10 billion a month, and they said uh, actually zero. And I, I said, uh, give me that again. And they said, well, we don't actually have auditors in Iraq. We have them in Virginia, and we are auditing Iraq from Virginia. That is what led to my repeated uh, uh, travels to Iraq. So uh, it is it, very difficult to do the, do the oversight of, of these contractors, and we are not really uh, set up to do that. But, uh, but uh, Mr. Dugan, any, any uh, comments on yeah, I mean, I think both the contracting workforce and the Federal workforce need to be on the table with respect to, to, to looking for, for places to save money. There is no question about that. But, but the biggest concern with that is if all we are interested in doing is saving money and we are not looking at the consequences of, of, of slashing budgets or doing away with a certain percentage of the workforce and not accounting for the work that is not going to be done or, or the, the reduced delivery of, of services to the taxpayers, I mean, that, that doesn't ever seem to be a, a part of any discussion um, when, when we talk about, um, you know, either cutting the salaries or freezing wages or, or um, uh, you know, right-sizing or downsizing the workforce through attrition or whatever other means. There is no, there's no accountability for What's the what's the impact to the services? You know, what is it that we're not going to do, or that we're going to do less of, and and nobody seems willing to make uh, make decisions on that, and that's the concern that I have. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. If I could, uh, our friends, uh, the National Treasury Employees Union and the National Active and Retired Federal Employees Association have submitted uh, uh, comments. Uh, in opposition to reducing the size of the Federal workforce in a haphazard fashion. And I would like those uh, reports, those, those comments to be entered into the record, if you would. Uh, without objection, they are entered. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I will recognize the distinguished gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for having this hearing. Um, I, I would note that uh, I represent uh, the third largest number of Federal employees in the United States. I also probably represent the largest number of Federal contractors in the United States, and I think they are both doing a wonderful job. Uh, <laughs> I also, uh, but I also believe, as does Chairman Issa, uh, based on his statement today, that this ought not to be a matter of theology. The idea that somehow platonically there is some ideal size for Federal employees, the number of Federal employees, and or the number of Federal contractors. Uh, gets us into the realm of theology rather than analysis. And I think Congress needs to insist on rigorous analysis, not arbitrary goal setting that has no basis uh, in any kind of analysis that tells us what our needs are or what value we get for our dollars. Uh, if I understood the testimony of our colleague, Ms. Lummis, she would exempt civilian employees from her attrition plan in DOD, Veterans Administration, and DHS. If that is a correct understanding, that exempts 66 percent of the entire civilian workforce, meaning that the attrition she talks about to achieve the goals she wishes falls disproportionately on those remaining civilian agencies, many of which, by the way, operate in her home state of Wyoming. Um, and I would, uh, I thought, Mr. Dugan, you made a very telling point. The title of this hearing, a very biased title, is the right, for, right sizing of the Federal Government, as if there apparently is some right size all of us subscribe to. I would like to know what that is. Uh, Mr. Biggs, do you have some idea of what the right size of the Federal Government ought to be in the 21st century? Well, I can give you a, uh, 
I'll give you a, the, the technical economist answer would be you hire Federal employees until the gain produced by the additional Federal employee equals the cost of the Federal employee, where the, the marginal benefit equals the marginal cost. And when we think about the, the productivity effects of downsizing the Federal government, we think if we lose that employee, are we losing uh, services to the public that well, but let me, the, let me, the cost okay, of that employee? Fair enough. But would you not agree, though, frankly, in the public sector, unlike the private sector, we have to do some differentiation. For example, how you measure productivity of border security guards is different than how you measure the productivity of uh, bench lab scientists at FDA trying to protect public safety in terms of health, foodborne illnesses, and pharmaceuticals. Well, you are exactly right. It is far, far easier to measure productivity and output in the private sector because you have dollars and cents mm -hmm. attached to it. If somebody is not willing to pay for a good and service, you say it is not worth no. what is being charged. I think that is one reason, though, why we want to have more activities conducted in the private sector where you do have a much more rigorous cost-benefit analysis done so, by consumers. So you would actually like to increase outside, outsourcing with Federal contracts? In, in theory, Yes. You don't think we've done enough of it in the last no, 10 I, years? I, well, I, it, the, the raw numbers are, are troubling. If outsourcing is done, in, in essence, to cover up Federal hiring, if you don't want to admit you are hiring Federal employees and you say, well, let's just do contracting instead, well, that is a wrong thing. But if you say that uh, a contractor provides better value for money on a year-to-year -year basis, but also provides, which I think is extremely valuable, the, the ability to recast the Federal workforce according to changing needs, that it may make sense. A contractor can be let go, and you can hire new contractors in different areas. We want fewer people in Iraq, more people working in health care. We can't do that what, with the current Federal What percentage of the current workforce is eligible for retirement in the near future? I think over the next 10 years or so, a majority, around, I believe the number is around 60 percent. Do you think it is reasonable to say that if 60 percent of the entire Federal workforce is eligible for retirement, of course, this Congress seems to be doing everything in its power to want to incentivize and accelerate retirements if they are possible, uh, and we are going to have attrition at the rate of 2 to 1, do you think the Federal workforce can actually do its job, especially when we are exempting 66 percent of it, uh, with that kind of attrition rate, given given the pending retirements we are looking at? I don't believe the proposals are to replace all retiring people forever at a 1 to 2 or 1 to 3 ratio. I believe the, I believe the proposals are to do it until you reach some level, say, 10 percent below the current workforce. Would it surprise you to learn that one of the major employers in, in Congresswoman uh, Loomis's home state, Wyoming, is the Federal Government? Not at all. And would it surprise you to know that, for, in fact, it is the dominant employer in many small rural places because of the Forest Service putting out fires and tending to protection of federal, federally protected no, that land? That wouldn't surprise me in the least. Particularly out west, the Federal Government is a larger presence in many ways than it is on the East Coast. Thank you. I see my time is up, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Connolly. Uh, now recognize the distinguished gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I thank the witnesses for coming. I admit that I must be put in the column with those who are trying to figure out what is right. I, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to be as rational as I can. I remember my mother used to tell us that right is right if nobody is right, and wrong is wrong if everybody is wrong. And so trying to figure out what would be the right size of government seems to me begs the question, because the first question that has to be answered is what do you view as the role and function of government? What is the purpose? What is the mission? What are you trying to accomplish? And I guess if we can answer those questions, then it gets easier to decide what the right size would be. It seems to me that the purpose of living, quite frankly, is to try and improve the quality of life and to make living more qualitative than what it is. And it's always been my opinion that if we're not doing that, then we're just kind of taking up space and perpetuating a world that uh, we accept. But let me ask you, uh, Mr. Biggs, you state in your testimony that the United States public sector workforce is around 
the middle of the pack, and, and I'm quoting, when compared to other developed countries, that 14.1 point percent of total employment, in making these comparisons, you include state and local government. Of course, we here in Congress cannot control what goes on in state and local government size. Uh, many other comparisons, when you talk about other countries, are not necessarily including state and local government. Now, so if one was to exclude state and local governments and make it a straight comparison with other developed countries, where would we then rank? The, the figures I cited were total government. And the, the reason I cited those figures, one, is because those are the only data available. But second, the United States is different from other countries, and all countries differ in the activities and responsibilities they allocate to the central government versus state versus local governments. So it, because of those differences in how we allocate different activities, looking at one sector of government between countries could give you a very, very misleading uh, point of view. We could look very big, we could look very large. It just it, it doesn't stand up analytically. So the, the point I made is, is a limited point where I can look only at combined state, federal, and local uh, workforces relative to other countries. And compared to countries that spend around the same share of their economies as us, our total public sector workforce is somewhere around 30 percent larger. Some of that is accounted for by the military, but I, I don't believe very much of it. Uh, Mr. Dugan, let me ask you, if, in fact, our workforce is larger than other countries' public workforces, um, what difference do you see that making in terms of the economy of the, the country? Well, again, I think, I think the focus needs to be on, on, on coming up with an answer to the question that you posed uh, at the beginning of, uh, of, of your statement, is what, is what is the work that we're about? Um, and, and I don't believe that we uh, uh, have, have a definite answer to that. I mean, I think we, can, we, have, we have some notion of what, the, what the, all of the Federal agencies currently do. Um, in, terms of the, in terms of the work that they provide and the goods and services that they provide to taxpayers. But the question on the table is, do we want and expect um, those, all of those agencies to continue to provide those goods and services, or is there some different mix of goods and services that, that, we, uh, that we're looking for? Until you answer that question, um, uh, I, I, I don't see any utility in talking about, you know, the numbers of Federal employees, because we have to decide what work it is that they are going to do and what the cost of that work is, and then ask ourselves, can we afford, th can we afford that? And if we can't, then we are going to have to decide what work it is we are not doing. And that is the conversation that hasn't been taking place in this country. And from my perspective, um, if we are going to get serious about reforming our, um, our financial um, uh, house, that is the first piece of business that needs to be done. Well, I see my time is up, so thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, and I wish to thank the witnesses for testifying today um, and taking time from your busy schedules to do so. Uh, that being all, this uh, committee stands adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>